Hi and welcome to Themeco. In this video, we are going to learn what are the benefits of applying numerical time integration to solve the equation of motion of dynamic systems. Also, we will familiarize ourselves to the two most typical methods which can be used for this purpose. One of which is called Euler's method, while the other is called Runge-Kutta method. Don't worry, we are not going to delve too deep into mathematics here, but instead we will use visual aids to understand these methods. Sounds like a good plan? So let's get started. Before going into these methods, however, we should understand why we would like to numerically integrate the equation of motion in the first place. What are the benefits of doing so? Well, to answer that, consider the following scenario in which we are measuring the acceleration response of the dynamic system to a given force by using an accelerometer. In this scenario, we will be able to measure the system's acceleration response. But what if, at some point, we would like to also obtain some information about the position response? How can we do it? Remember, we can't use an accelerometer directly because it only measures the system's acceleration response. Okay, some of you may suggest using some kind of position measurement sensor. Yes, that is possible. But what if we don't have suitable equipment available? Or we just don't have enough space for using two separate sensors? Luckily, there is one option that you may not have considered earlier. As you know, acceleration is a second derivative of position. Therefore, to determine the system's position at a specific time, we can use a suitable numerical integration software. This saves us from the need to acquire the extra equipment or space for measuring both the responses. There is one aspect, however, that we need to keep in mind. Since the system's position response is derived by using double integration of the acceleration, we will not have as accurate a response curve as we would if we used a position sensor. This is because of the limitations that are mostly related to the numerical algorithms that are used to obtain the position data from the measured acceleration. In Euler's method, we approximate the velocity and position responses by fitting small tangent lines over short time distances to the response curve. In velocity approximation, this fitting is done to the acceleration's response curve whereas in position approximation, this is done to the obtained velocity response curve. By doing this, we can determine the corresponding integral values for the velocity and position by measuring the rectangular area that is under the curve of that function. The rectangular areas related to the velocity and position integral values can be measured by using these equations. As we can see from the equations, Euler's numerical integration technique is an iterative procedure which requires some boundary conditions. In this case, the boundary conditions are the initial values of the position and velocity which are changing for every iterative step. Note that what dictates the accuracy of this technique is our defined time step delta t, which should remain the same for every iteration to avoid errors. Usually we need to make some compromises between the accuracy and the computing power. Using big time steps can help us save computing resources, but the accuracy of the obtained solution curve will not be that good. In cases where we are approximating more complex response curves, it is mandatory to use quite small time steps to avoid cumulative errors. Let's discuss briefly about the Runge-Kutta method. Unlike Euler's method, which uses only one slope to determine the integral value during one time interval, the Runge-Kutta method uses four different slopes which have certain weights for the same approximation. This causes the method to be mathematically heavier compared to Euler's method, but the possible errors caused by choosing an improper time step are minimized. Let's see how we can find these four slopes. First, we calculate the derivative or the slope k1 at the beginning of our time interval and then create a triangle by projecting the derivative to the end point of the interval. Then we can determine its half height point where we draw a horizontal line. We also draw a vertical line in the middle of our time interval so that these two lines will intersect with each other at the midpoint. Now that we have discovered where our second point is located, we can calculate the second slope k2 which we'll use to create a second triangle by projecting the slope to the middle point of the second time interval. Like in the previous steps of this procedure, we will find the length of the half height of the second triangle and translate it to the base of the first triangle at the same interval point where our second slope is located. At this point, we determine our third slope, k3, and then draw one more triangle by using this new slope. After we find the length of half height of the third triangle, 
we translate this height onto the base of the first triangle at the end of the first time interval and calculate the final slope k4. Now that we have found our four needed slopes, we can perform the Runge-Kutta slope approximation as this. We can then apply this to the same equation as in the case of Euler's method to obtain the system's current position. Hopefully, after watching this video, you are familiar with the different benefits of utilizing time integration and you also know which considerations need to be taken into account when it's applied. You also know the steps of performing Euler's method or Runge-Kutta method which are very typical examples of numerical integration methods used to solve a dynamic system's equation of motion. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.